Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from the CUNY TV Foundation, Capital One Bank, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, New York Community Bank, the Wickoff Group, M&T Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, Urban American, and These Friends. So they arrive from Germany, born in a displaced citizens camp in Germany, come to the Bronx, go to Brooklyn, Columbia, Harvard, NIH, and then to become the dean of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I'm very fortunate to have Dr. Alan Spiegel as my guest today. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. So tell me a little bit about your parents and your grandparents, because they both, they were from uh, Lutz, I think? I think it's, uh, I don't know Polish, but they used to pronounce it Ludz, okay. L-O-D-Z in the anglicized version. Yes, they're both from that city, the second largest city in Poland, and uh, their respective families there as well. Uh, my father was in the Polish army at the outbreak of World War II. He was a tailor. My mother was part of a large family. They owned uh, a large uh, fabric uh, company. And you said your mother, I believe, was more religious. Uh, her, her, her family was observant. His observant. was not, in fact. His was not. Grandparents, sadly, uh, I know only uh, from what I hear from my parents. That's a recurrent theme, as you'll hear. So what, what happens? Your parents, uh, they're in the ghetto, right? The war breaks out. They, they're you know. married. They got married prior to the war, 1939? They did. Uh, as you know, uh, they were attacked uh, from the east by the Soviets, from the west by the Germans. That was the... Nazi uh, von Ribbentrop Pact, till they attacked the Soviets later. Uh, the Nazis come in, they come into Lodz, they herd the Jews into the ghetto, which they did in all the other cities. And that was the longest surviving ghetto. They actually each survived uh, till uh, the ghetto was liquidated with the Soviets within earshot, basically. September 27, 1944, they're loaded on the cattle cars with what remains of their family. Some died in the ghetto and brought to Auschwitz. Now, your father's liberated, I believe, by the... Uh, the Americans. By the Americans. Your mother was liberated they, by the Russians. They, they were separated very quickly uh, at Auschwitz. He remained there for the duration. Uh, by that I mean, again, the Soviets are consistently moving west, taking over territory, and before they can liberate the camp, the Germans organize literally a death march. This is the one that Elie Wiesel wrote about. They're brought right, to they, Buchenwald, uh, another camp in Germany proper, and there the Americans liberate the camp. My mother, in contrast, was very quickly moved to a different camp. She ended up in Czechoslovakia, liberated by uh, the Soviets. And then, uh, you asked about this earlier, they each uh, migrated back to their city of origin, to Lodz, and remarkably, they were the sole survivors pretty much of their families, reunited. 
and then they the displaced citizens camp. Well, he, he presciently realized that they didn't want to remain in Poland, and it was pretty clear that there was even after the war, pretty severe anti-Semitism there. Uh, this is a theme, by the way, you read about this now, places like Hungary, etc. The upshot is uh, they came back across what was to become the Iron Curtain, came, ended up in a displaced persons camp in the south of Germany called Landsberg, and there I, I purportedly was you the, the first, first child You were the born. first child That's, born, uh, and the interesting thing, uh, your bris was uh, performed on what type of material? Well, my father, being a tailor, had to have some garment for me, and he used the silk of an American parachute. We still have that. It was used for our son's uh, bris as well, and uh, it's something we treasure and, and keep. Now, have they uh, come to America? I think that had I not been born, I'm told, they would have gone to Israel. That was their plan. Uh, I think they felt uh, with a child that would be more difficult. And so we came in 1949, I was born in 46, uh, under something called the Truman Quota, and uh, arrived strangely first in Boston by ship, but quickly a train trip. And it was actually, sorry to correct you, it was not the Bronx, but Manhattan, in fact, living on 555 West 155th Street in Manhattan. Not, not too far from the Yeshiva University. Not too far, actually very close to the Polo Grounds, which yeah. existed then. So tell me, at that time, your father gets a job as a tailor? He's working in the garment district. Right, and your mother is uh, working hats, right? The she, she actually uh, was not working initially, and uh, I attended a nursery school. Uh, I uh, started in public school in kindergarten and first grade, right in that part of Manhattan. And because of the observant family she was from and her feeling that I needed to have uh, a strong grounding in, in Jewish and religious studies, uh, I ended up uh, at a yeshiva co-ed, very progressive elementary school called Yeshiva Salavatric. And uh, they charged tuition, which was hard to afford on a tailor's salary in the garment district. So she went to work as a cleaning lady. Right, for the dentist. For a German Jewish dentist, not now, far from Yeshiva. Now you told me that uh, you had a neighbor, uh, this uh, white Anglo-Saxon, woman uh, with silver hair or blue hair, yes. and she, would, she was the person who taught you English. Indeed. Mrs. Mrs. Weil, and, and you're right, so silver blue, sort of gray hair, looking a little like the picture of George Washington on the one dollar bill, strangely enough. And uh, I feel uh, I credit her to the extent that my English is relatively good. Uh, it's really thanks to her. My parents, of course, did not speak English. Uh, they spoke Polish, and Yiddish. they spoke Yiddish. Yiddish is what we communicated in. Polish is what they used to keep secrets from me. Uh, and then it was kind of reverse osmosis. They learned some English from me, and eventually you know, they went to nice school and, and became citizens. Now, from, from, the, uh, from Upper Manhattan, then they moved to Brooklyn. Yes, this was, uh, I, I may have mentioned that there was delirious and derisive laughter when I recounted this to some folks, uh, saying that we came to Manhattan and moved to Brooklyn. They, you know, laughed, shouldn't be the other way around. But in fact, this was a step up for him. He had managed to save enough money and with a cousin buy a cleaning and tailoring store in the East New York section of Brooklyn, and we moved there, absolutely. And then where'd you go to school? Uh, we moved, uh, and in the Crown Heights section, there was yet another yeshiva again. My mother was stuck on this proposition, and that completed elementary school, and then beginning high school at uh, a school which is now defunct. It has the lengthy name Yeshiva University High School Brooklyn for boys. Uh, the most famous graduate, Alan Dershowitz. But uh, I went to that school, uh, graduated in 63, uh, and it was a terrific education. Now, what's interesting is when your father had the tailor store, and um, one of the legends of Ebbets Field was Abe Stark, who was a Brooklyn Borough president, I believe. That's right. And uh, you were mentioning that when, when his store had big sales, uh, he would send the customers over to your father's tailor shop, and then you would sometimes make the delivery and the Indeed, indeed. Uh, that was one of my jobs. I tried to help out. My mother helped out in the store as well. It was, it was a, a family affair. Uh, and I would deliver uh, the garments that were altered during these sales and get a nice tip of 50 cents from uh, Abe Stark. Were you able to get the salami also? 
<laughs> I'm not sure what treats I, I bought, but I'm sure there. No, was no, no, because, because he he had he had a situation. If he had a home run, ah. you were able to get a salami. That was the, no, that wasn't that wasn't okay. part of the okay, deal. Okay, that that, that was one of the, the uh, hit yeah. a home run yeah, at Ebbets Field. But but my dad, just to, to mention, I mean, his artistry as a tailor was was significant. The, this was the transitional era when double-breasted suits were going out of style. You remember those old movies, and he had the ability to convert. Uh, these double-breasted suits into single-breasted suits, and that—that that was really a significant business. You know, a sort of upper-end, higher-end clientele who had, you know, a wonderful wardrobe of these things didn't want to just toss them out, and he repaired them. Now you're just saying to me, when you were going to growing up, you you knew that you had this desire for upward mobility. Yes. Okay, and that was physicians. Okay, this was like in the DNA of many Jewish kids True. to become a doctor. True. So tell me about that. Well, uh, you know, it was kind of several parallel and ultimately synergistic trends. You're right. The sociologic one is a typical, as my daughter once said, as I was driving her back to college Amherst, you know, Dad, you have an immigrant mentality. And it's true. <laughs> I, and as you may hear, my, my wife are both uh, immigrants. Uh, that's the American story. You want to move up. Uh, not just economically, it's not about the big bucks necessarily, but uh, gaining uh, respect. And being a physician was a path to that. And it was a path that to me was extremely appealing because beyond that sociologic reason, uh, I was always uh, fascinated by science. Uh, I, I had an ecumenical interest in science. Right, you had mentioned science that uh, the encyclopedia, you read the entire encyclopedia. Well, I wouldn't quite, quite go that far. Okay. It wasn't the Britannica. But, you know, again, this is so typical of parents who uh, ultimately, you know, it comes down to family. They were so supportive. Uh, they probably succumbed to the blandishments of some encyclopedia salesman. And, yes, systematically and somewhat obsessively, I was going from A to Z to, to go through this. But I, I had, you know, to be immodest, a voracious desire to learn, with science being, you know, the thing of, of most interest. So becoming a physician, uh, if, if you think about the three parts of that, the, the, the social opered mobility, gaining respect and probably a decent livelihood, uh, the ability to do something that was science-based, and then the fact that this was something where you could literally uh, do good to humanity. I mean, what, what's more compassionate than being a physician? Now, what's very interesting is when you're going to high school, yes, uh, which relates later on, at the age of 16, you get a job in the lab at this new medical school, which was founded in the 50s, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University. Exactly. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's uh, quite serendipitous in terms of full circle. Uh, you remember Sputnik, the Soviet satellite, it sent a chill during the Cold War through the country in general, and it was the feeling that we were behind in science. National Science Foundation created a number of programs for high school students, and this was one. So it was the summer uh, after my junior year in high school, taking the subway from Brooklyn still have that all picture. the way to the Bronx. Yes, and this was a picture which I uh, resurrected from my mom's place when she had migrated down to Florida, the Daily News, showing me uh, pouring things in a test tube. Uh, and she was quite proud of that. And it was a formative experience for me. And by the way, that building, the Forsheimer building, still exists at Einstein. Having said that, we've renovated it significantly. Yeah. So now what happens, you're graduating high school, and how do you decide where you're going to go to college? Uh, you know, you knew you were going to want to be a physician. That was exactly, set in the mind. Exactly. So you, the, the typical aspirations, and you know, this is, my parents are not role models, but uh, first, uh, even at this high school, there were people typically going to places like Columbia. Uh, there's a man named Walter Reich, who was, was at one point uh, the director of the Holocaust Museum in D.C., uh, he went to this high school, uh, ended up going to Columbia. Uh, I ended up applying to Harvard, Columbia, Dartmouth for some strange reason. Again, there was a high school student who had preceded me who'd gone there uh, to Cornell. Cornell and Columbia uh, had the advantage of the Regent Scholarship. If you passed the Regent's uh, exam in New York State, you got that scholarship money, so you knew at least that you'd have that. Partial tool. scholarship. Exactly. Right. And, you know, if, if I wouldn't have sufficient scholarship, because it was again clear that my parents didn't have the means to put me through full tuition. So, so you go to Columbia, yeah, and you're living in Brooklyn at this time? Or? No, I, I was fortunate enough to get almost a full scholarship and Including eventually, uh, yes, and, and, and work study. I, I worked uh, basically at various jobs at Columbia, so I had a, a room in the dormitory. Right, and one of the summers in Columbia worked up as Kutcher's as a... Yeah, this, as was, a, a, this was a plum job. I was a busboy. 
uh, in the Catskills at Kutcher's Country Club, uh, and it really there was a sports connection. Not that I was an athlete. I actually right, at they Columbia, had the basketball camp. They had uh, the exactly the Maurice Stokes Memorial Game. It was the bellhops who were you know college stars. But I had a couple of classmates who were on the football team, and the athletic director at Columbia w had a connection with people at Kutcher's. So that was uh, a terrific opportunity. Now, another summer, you end up in Germany. Yes, and, and it, it is a bit strange and a little counterintuitive, but I had a desire to, to sort of go back and, and see what that was like. Uh, again, uh, a college classmate, uh, one a year ahead of me, uh, had gone to a so-called Max Planck Institute these were uh, institutes uh, which were throughout Germany and had been really major centers of research and investigation. So I ended up in Frankfurt in Germany at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysics and had, again, a kind of a scholarship and, and lived on the site. And it was an extraordinary experience. And you also traveled a little bit, right? Uh, a little bit. Uh, when I talk about uh, surviving family, uh, I have still... Uh, essentially a niece, uh, so she'd be a first cousin, a niece of my mother who survived as a teenager, and this was very rare, uh, those survivors were sent to uh, England. And so she lived in London, and I, on the way, visited her and her family. Absolutely. So, so now you're at Columbia. How do you decide which medical school do you want to go to? Again, you know, why not aim for uh, the highest? Uh, well, again, there's a Harvard mentality that's the highest. Uh, I just capture that in, in a moment. I actually ended up doing my internship and residency at the Mass General Hospital. And, you know, those places think they're the center of the universe. It turns out there are other places, Einstein among them, that are are, are quite good. But the upshot is yes. Uh, I was uh, rejected by Harvard, and there's a story related to that, at not the medical school level, but undergraduate. the graduate level. Yeah, I'm undergoing an alumni interview, and the fellow says, you're coming from the Yeshiva High School, so you're obviously going to need kosher food. On the other hand, you need a scholarship, and the kosher food costs mo more money. Now, again, maybe that's not the reason I was rejected, but the fact is... But subsequently, you were accepted. You'd, you'd have a lawsuit nowadays, right, right. for a discrimination. At the medical school, I was accepted promptly, and really it w that too was a wonderful education. So when you were at medical school, how did you decide to do more research? You were, you were trained, but research was an important Yeah, so area. You, I've already emphasized the interest in, in, in science, and thinking through the medical specialties, it's pretty clear that internal medicine, so again, I don't have uh, the, the physical skills to be a surgeon, that became obvious to me very early on. So a more cognitive uh, kind of specialty. And then the one that was extremely science-based was endocrinology, the study of hormones. Uh, extremely appealing because at a biochemical and science level, there had been tremendous advances. The various hormones had been purified, characterized. And at the same time, uh, dramatic, dramatic improvements. If a person had too much of a hormone, there were ways of treating them too little of a hormone, hormone replacement. So this is one of the most satisfying specialties at the time and very science-based. That appealed to me, combining clinical medicine with a career in research. So you continue up in Boston going to Mass General for your internship. Exactly. Uh, two years, just <coughs> uh, internship and what's called junior residency. And then because my year of graduation, 71, was the last year of the so-called doctor draft, every physician had to do two years in the military, uh, my way of uh, doing that, and that was true of a lot of people interested in academic medicine, was to go to the Commission Corps, as it's called, of the Public Health Service. And that was at the National Institutes of Health, the NIH. Uh, Bethesda, Maryland, uh, arrived in 73 in the lab of someone, in fact, who uh, was a tremendous scientist, the late Gerald Arbach, purified parathyroid hormone. It's, it's something used for osteoporosis nowadays. So talk to me, because, you know, when you and I chatted, 33 years at NIH, yes. people listened to it, but it wasn't 30, it was 33 years, but there were different segments to the 33 Ab years. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about the, the segments of your life, because, I mean, you, you, you were very involved with Washington, you were involved in major... At the, at the, uh, late, the, at the latest. At the latest with right. Bush and everything, but yeah, let's talk about the beginning. So, 73 to 2006, 33 years indeed. Uh, arriving as a fellow with the idea that it's two years and I do my service and go back to the As Mass you said, General. you were living in Garden Apartment. You Indeed. At, you thought you may be coming back. Rockville, Maryland. But, but, but by back. that time, your, par your father uh, had died. They, or, no, no. They, they, they they'd moved to Century Village in Florida. They, they moved there uh, not until roughly 1980 or so. It's, it's uh, almost immediately after our son was born in, in 81. Uh, so they were still living in Brooklyn, in a different part of Brooklyn. He was retired, no longer in the store. Uh, so to come back to the NIH phases, uh, so first as a fellow, 
And then it became apparent that there was an opportunity. They were interested in my staying on permanently as what was called a senior investigator. We bought a small <coughs> house, and now, that was a senior the first investigator phase. and their chronology. Yes. So the the NIH campus, and this is what's called the intramural program. It's the ten percent of the budget, which is the research done there. Uh, that was really the the formative stage of of my career. What you had was a building, which was the clinical center. And you you heard this during the government shutdown. The patients with cancer who were excluded from the clinical center. It's not the same building. They built a new version of it, but uh, that, I, I was at that clinical center. Long, long halls, bowling alley-like of labs, and I had a lab on one of those floors. And then you'd walk through a door, long, long halls of patient, inpatient wards. The remarkable thing is, I like to say it was the least real-world place to practice medicine, not because there weren't patients and they didn't have serious diseases, but because there's no remuneration, no insurance, uh, everyone to, on a research Totally protocol. research. So I'd be doing laboratory studies and eventually running a whole lab with you know, 15, 16 people, but also seeing patients. And that was extraordinarily satisfying. That's the definition of a physician scientist. The next stage. Well, uh, at the tender age of 45, uh, I was given the opportunity to direct the entire intramural program of my institute. People are confused by this. It's the National Institutes of Health. There are 26 of these, believe it or not, so it's sort of a confederation. And the names of them change at the whim of Congress. So Mary Lasker, for example, was responsible right. for splitting off arthritis from the name of our institute, it became a separate one. Eventually, this was the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Disease, and I directed the intramural program. Uh, that meant about a $100 million budget a few hundred scientists and some really outstanding, extraordinary people doing research, but able to keep up my own research as well. That was 90 to 99. And 99, that Harold was... Harold Varmus, then the NIH director, appoints me the director of the entire institute. And now you're talking about a $1.7 billion budget. Uh, you're not directly hands-on involved in running the research there. Instead, you're responsible You're an administrator. You know, you know the example I often give is Directing, being a dean of a medical school, or even being this intramural director, is like being a, a conductor of a symphony. Being a director of one of the institutes, as I was, is like is being the head of the National <coughs> Endowment for the Arts. You're the one giving out the grants uh, and, and populating the people who so, are. So, when, these what symphony. happens after 33 years? Yes. You know, you, there's an opportunity at an institution that was started in, in the early 50s, it really started because Jewish people couldn't get into medical school. That's correct. Uh, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine that Albert Einstein gave his name lent to. Lent his name to. Lent his name to it. How how this opportunity uh, open to you to? Needless to say, during the course of these 33 years. Always had opportunities. Opportunities right? are there, and I, I'm <coughs> you know looking at them in some genuine way. and it, varied and uh, I won't go through those different instances. Although it was it's interesting in retrospect to look at that because I spend so much of my time now recruiting and, and we've recruited a huge number of fantastic faculty uh, at Einstein. But ultimately, uh, I came to the conclusion that I had still one strong push left in me and I wanted to really devote it to something that I felt was really worthwhile something where I could really make a difference. Not that the NIH wasn't a wonderful place. The colleagues were wonderful. Uh, these are extraordinary people. It's a misappropriation uh, to turn, right, turn these Right, but you could make your mark but in, in a different form of education. Indeed, and, and in a sense, uh, as I just alluded to earlier, you know, as the institute director, you're sort of several steps removed from the direct action. Here, uh, becoming a dean, A, of a medical school is an extraordinary privilege. You are responsible for a tripartite mission, educating the next generation of physicians, recruiting people and overseeing and enabling and empowering researchers. And also having researchers. a major research institute. Exactly. And then uh, with our university hospital, the Montefiore Medical Center, uh, being involved in healthcare delivery and in the Bronx. Right. And that, uh, a very, very. And you're also new, now area. doing healthcare delivery in Brooklyn with a relationship with Maimonides. With Maimonides, absolutely. Right. The, the Brooklyn campus. So, but but to, come back, to come back to, you know, just to capture this point, uh, the fact is that Einstein was unequivocally, by 1970, one of the top medical schools in the country. And here was an opportunity uh, to really uh, enhance it even further. And that was really what motivated me, the fact that uh, the, the board at Einstein, uh, board of overseers, had come to the conclusion that they wanted to get into a new phase and move to a new level. And to entrust me with the responsibility for carrying forward that school 
was an opportunity that I, I decided I had to. Now you, <coughs> you tell me the interesting story that you came down and you even stayed in the Bronx when you were interviewed, right? Well, why not? Uh, my wife uh, was working still at, at the, the World, World Bank. Bank. Uh, she, uh, we commuted for the first two and a half years. We didn't have a place in the city. Why waste money on, on, on a hotel or a rental apartment, etc.? We have these three very good high-rise towers where our medical students and graduate students live. They outfitted an ap apartment for me on the 25th floor, and for the first four months, that's where I lived. It was sort of in under the radar and able to really get the feel for the place. But I, I always tell the students when I recount the story, I don't want to be hypocritical, I do live on the Upper East Side now. Einstein is a different institution than it's been over the years. Part of it's the research and the other things. And how do you see the role of uh, Einstein in uh, healthcare? Well, uh, Einstein, uh, I believe, is a different institution today. I've had now the opportunity to work there as dean for a little over seven years. And uh, I want to stress that what we are is not a function of my accomplishments. A dean, a dean it's, it's, basically it's, is... I think it's a combination of all of your faculty. Yes. The Board of Overseers, yes. the supporters, it's everyone, okay? It's and all of the above and a phenomenal team that I've been able to recruit. Uh, people at the level of the facilities director, the advancement director, our communications director, CFO. Th these are such dedicated and it's, phenomenal it's, people. It's bringing all someone into the next, the next generation. Okay. So, so fundamentally, first, we're declared one of the 40 most beautiful medical school campuses in the country. For a campus in the Bronx, this is, I think, quite an achievement. And you know, uh, it is beautiful. And our facilities director deserves a lot of the credit there. Of course, having this beautiful Price Center Block Pavilion, which we opened right. in 2008, remarkable. We've recruited 120 faculty members since I've been there, 100 at the assistant associate professor level, 20 at the full professor department level. Okay. This is a phenomenal rise. Tell me a little bit about you married, you met your wife at a mixer, right, at Columbia? Indeed. She went to City College. Uh, she graduated two years after I did. Uh, we did meet at a mixer in, in the, the Crown Room. Remember, it used to be King's College before it was Columbia. Right. And, uh, you know, we, we uh, have had a lifelong romance, I would say. Tell me about your children. Uh, two children, uh, a daughter, Rachel, who is uh, 38, uh, two grandchildren. That and their names? Had. Uh, their names are Sophie and Clara Esther. Because, because if we don't mention them, you know, those, those are critical. And, and let's mention my wife's name, Rita, of right. course. Our son is Daniel, Danny, uh, and he's 32. Uh, the uh, person who started life as a concert pianist and is now a, a lawyer, actually a public defender in North Carolina. Our daughter, an art historian, and has worked in a gallery, but now has her hands full with a 10-month-old and literally three-year-old on November 4th. So as one would say, you know, you, your life has come full circle from the, uh, the beginnings uh, in Germany, you know, yes. uh, to, uh, uh, to, to New York, to Washington, to yes. around the world. And uh, this is so true. Uh, and I thought about it, sadly. Uh, my mother died December 10th of 2012 at the age of 94. We're not totally exactly <laughs> sure about her age. And literally that next morning, uh, our second grandchild is born. And this is, you know, as in the biblical expression, a generation goes, a generation comes. But the thing that's so poignant to me, and, you know, it, it really is poignant, is here is a Holocaust survivor who still had the faith to carry on with her life, to bear children. And now here you have the next uh, great grandchildren. And she had the good fortune. She met the first grandchild. And we have pictures of that. That's it's remarkable. Wonderful. So thank you very much for being here. Absolutely, my pleasure. Okay.